At the Northern Yen Royal Palace, the envoy from Southern Yen expressed his outrage, stating that their princess had been there for less than a day and had already suffered great humiliation. He emphasized that Southern Yen had come in the spirit of friendship between the two nations, and thus he boldly questioned how such an incident could occur under the emperor's watch. Princess Lan, who was sobbing uncontrollably, stood beside the Southern Yen envoy, prepared to hear the emperor's response. If the emperor failed to provide a satisfactory answer, Southern Yen would resort to war with Northern Yen to erase the disgrace inflicted upon the princess. Shui Akshan, the emperor of Northern Yen, observed the situation carefully. His mother, the Dowager Empress of Northern Yen, weighed in, criticizing the Empress for her reckless actions, which had led to concubine land suffering. She promised to handle the matter with fairness and asked her son for his opinion on the situation. Princess Fan Qian of Northern Yen, the one at the center of the incident, was brought forward by the Emperor, who asked if she realized what she had done wrong. The young girl standing beside Qin responded that Her Highness had only lost her temper for a brief moment and insisted that nothing had been done intentionally. To make matters worse, she explained, the princess had just woken up and was not yet fully alert. Enraged, the envoy of Southern Yen questioned the girl's identity, demanding to know how she dared to speak in the emperor's presence and what right she had to involve herself in the conversation. At this, Princess Qin grew furious, rebuking the envoy for interrupting. She reminded him that this was the harem of Northern Yen, and as an envoy of Southern Yen, he had no right to interfere. She stated firmly that their princess had entered Northern Yen's harem, and matters of the harem were family matters. If he wished to discuss affairs of state, he should first take the princess back to Southern Yen and then send a formal envoy to negotiate peace. Otherwise, he should remain silent. The envoy of Southern Yen was left speechless by this argument. Meanwhile, the emperor, too, was surprised, silently reflecting on how the usually arrogant empress had suddenly become so forceful and commanding since entering the harem of northern Yen. Concubine Lan spoke up, explaining that ever since she had entered the harem, she had been a part of northern Yen. She insisted that she was merely seeking justice and asked whether the empress had the right to do whatever she pleased within the harem. Furthermore, concubine Lan accused the empress of having committed acts of terror against the other concubines claiming that many were too frightened to speak up. Despite the potential consequences, she stood her ground, asserting that she would continue to seek justice for the concubines, even if it meant facing punishment herself. The Dowager Empress, seeing the situation escalate, instructed Princess Fan Qian to stand up and acknowledge that she was indeed in the wrong. She assured her that she would deliver the justice Fan Qian deserved. However, concubine Lan was not as naive as she appeared. She believed that everything was unfolding according to her plan. Known for her arrogance and superiority, Fan Qian was infamous for bullying other concubines, which was entirely in line with her character. She had used a simple trick to provoke Can, and the confrontation escalated to the point where Fan Qian struck her in the chest during their altercation. Despite not understanding why Command was still alive, everything was progressing according to her plan. Soon enough, she would be able to bring command down from her high status. From the very beginning, this had been her strategy, using her martial arts skills, Shinan should have been dead by now. The Empress Dowager confronted Kan, accusing her of hitting others without showing any remorse, acting as if nothing had happened. She questioned Kan's understanding of the royal law and ordered her to immediately apologize to the princess. If Kan refused, she would be sent to the cold palace for a month to reflect on her actions. The emperor remained silent throughout this exchange and can grudgingly agreed to apologize. However, the envoy of Southern Yen informed Ken that, according to their customs, she was required to kneel three times and knock her head against the ground nine times. Instead of kneeling, Ken struck concubine Lan so hard that she collapsed to the floor beneath her. Ken coldly remarked that it didn't matter whether she hit Lan once or a hundred times, she had already defeated her. Everyone in the room was shocked by Ken's brazen slap. She then declared that if the concubine wanted an apology, she would have to wait for her next life. Turning to her young servant Zisu, Ken ordered her to follow, and when Zisu asked where they were headed, Ken calmly responded that they were going to the Cold Palace. Ken and Zisu arrived at the Cold Palace, a place known for its perpetual coldness and dampness. Zisu, concerned for her empress, asked how Ken could possibly live in such a miserable place. Ken believed that Zisu was unaware of the Empress's fate, she had died after being punched in the chest by Princess Lan. 
Despite this, Ken shrugged it off, saying she actually found the place to be somewhat pleasant. In reality, she was no longer just Fei Can, the emperor of Northern Yen, she was the notorious assassin known as Silver Fox, a soul from the modern age. Her extraordinary abilities included assassination, disguise, tracking, and skating. She had assumed her life was over when she was involved in a catastrophic plane crash, but she was shocked to find herself waking up, traveling through time and space, and inhabiting Fei Can's body. Fortunately, her memories remained intact, allowing her to skillfully navigate her new reality. Meanwhile, Zissa continued to worry about her empress, urging Ken to ask the emperor for forgiveness, believing that his majesty wouldn't punish her considering the prime minister's influence. Fang Khan, the prime minister, was Ken's father, a man who held a position second only to the emperor himself. Zissa believed this would protect Ken, but Ken had no intention of relying on her father's status any longer. Ken reassured Zisu, praising the cold palace for its spaciousness and cleanliness, describing it as both simple and luxurious. She then expressed her hunger and requested Zisu to bring her some noodles. However, when Zisu returned, she was holding her face and had no noodles. It was clear that she had been slapped. Furious, Ken demanded to know who had struck her. Zisu explained that it was servant Lai from the royal kitchen. Zisu had requested a bowl of noodles, but Servant Lai informed her that because Ken now resided in the cold palace, she was only entitled to leftovers. When Zisu tried to defend Ken, Servant Lai slapped her. Enraged, Ken declared the situation outrageous, exclaiming that she was only worthy of leftovers now? Determined to confront this insult, she ordered Zisu to accompany her to the royal kitchen. Though Ken believed she could tolerate many indignities in the cold palace, she refused to accept being starved to death. In the royal kitchen, a lady questioned servant Lai about why she had dared to strike the empress's servant. The lady, known for standing up for what she believes, pointed out that the empress wouldn't overlook such an offense. However, servant Lai dismissively asked, what is there to fear? The empress had been sent to the cold palace, how could anyone be afraid of a woman banished there? Furthermore, Lai claimed that since she had been the emperor's nurse during his infancy and was favored by the empress dowager, there was no real consequence for her actions. She even added that the empress dowager adored her hibiscus cake, making her indispensable. Lai confidently stated that the empress dowager had been displeased with the empress for a long time. It was only because of the prime minister's influence that she hadn't acted against the empress before. Now, Lai claimed, she was merely doing what the Empress Dowager wished. At that moment, Ken entered the kitchen and confronted Lai, demanding to know if she was the one who had hit her servant. Ken, now standing firm as the Empress, showed no fear of Lai and boldly admitted that she had broken the rules by striking her servant. Lai arrogantly responded that she was only following palace regulations, which dictated that any woman in the cold palace was entitled only to leftovers. She claimed she had been imparting this lesson on behalf of the Empress Dowager. In response, Ken slapped Lai, reminding her that despite being in the cold palace, she was still the Empress and deserved respect. Lai had no right to insult her. Ken declared that if she didn't administer punishment, others would think they could treat her with the same disrespect. Lai, furious, threatened that the Empress Dowager would retaliate once she learned what had happened. But Ken stood her ground, stating that even if the Empress Dowager were present, she would still have beaten Lai. Just then, a servant entered, announcing the Empress Dowager's arrival. The Dowager, impatient, was demanding her hibiscus cake, saying she couldn't wait any longer. Lai, trying to save herself, quickly sought justice from the Empress Dowager. She explained that she had been preparing the cake when Zisu arrived, requesting noodles for the Empress. Lai refused saying she didn't want to delay the Empress Dowager's cake. She complained that Ken had then stormed into the kitchen, furious, and attacked her. To make matters worse, Ken had boldly declared she would have acted the same even if the Empress Dowager had been present. Like question why Ken, who was supposed to be in the cold palace, had come to the royal kitchen to cause trouble, completely disregarding the rules of the palace. Ken, unfazed, gently took the Empress Dowager's hand and reminded her of the moment when she had first entered the palace. Back then, the Empress Dowager had held Ken's hand and told her that after taking over the Phoenix Seal from the former Empress, everyone, including the Empress herself, must follow Ken's orders. Ken reminded the Dowager that as long as she held the Phoenix Seal, 
she was in charge of the harem and all its members must obey her. Ken then calmly asked how her actions could possibly defy the Empress Dowager's expectations when she was simply carrying out her orders. The Empress Dowager, infuriated, left the kitchen and returned to the palace, visibly angered. Ken bid her a safe journey, sarcastically expressing hope that the Dowager would live as long as the heavens themselves. Afterward, Ken turned her attention back to Lai. She instructed Zisu to call for someone to drag Lai out and beat her forty times. However, Zisu hesitated, explaining that no one was willing to listen to her anymore. Ken then commanded Zisu to carry out the punishment herself, telling her that now was her chance to take revenge for being struck earlier. Lai, panicked, warned Ken that she couldn't do such a thing, reminding her that she was the emperor's wet nurse. But Ken coldly responded that she didn't care who Lai was, she was going to carry out the punishment regardless. Without hesitation, Ken began slapping Lai herself. Meanwhile, at the royal study, the emperor, Swan, was having a moment of quiet reflection when Falling Shade, the leader of the Shadow Guard, entered. He informed the emperor that the empress had left the cold palace without permission and caused a scene in the royal kitchen. Wan was spending some time alone, reflecting on recent events. Not only had Ken slapped servant Lai, but she had also disrespected the empress dowager, treating her rudely. The servants reported that the Empress Dowager nearly fainted and had immediately requested a physician upon her return to the palace. However, when Falling Shade, the leader of the Shadow Guard, tried to inform him of this, one dismissed the issue as unimportant, instructing Falling Shade not to bother him with such trivial matters from now on. Falling Shade then shifted the conversation to a more pressing concern. He informed one that Princess Lan was now surrounded by a number of Kung Fu masters, and he was suspicious of her believing that she was scheming something. Despite this, Falling Shade noted that the Emperor would still need her for future plans. Wan ordered Falling Shade to keep a close watch on Princess Lan, ensuring that no threat developed from her entourage. Curious, Wan asked if there was anything else he needed to know. Falling Shade reported that the royal kitchen had noticed that the noodles made by the top chef's son for the Emperor had been stolen, and they suspected the Empress was responsible. Meanwhile, the Empress, Can, was comfortably enjoying the stolen noodles in the cold palace. She delighted in their exceptional taste, though the most remarkable thing wasn't the flavor itself but the strange, sweet energy she felt coursing through her body, lifting her spirits. Ken mused that after all the trouble she caused, the royal kitchen would certainly be more vigilant now. She worried this might be the last time she'd be able to enjoy such a delicacy. Suddenly, a pot fell from the sky, startling her. She inspected it, marveling at the intricate dragon patterns decorating its surface, unsure if they were hieroglyphs or a map. Despite its valuable appearance, she couldn't identify the material it was made of. As she examined the pot, a cat suddenly emerged from it, declaring with pride that she was correct in appreciating such fine craftsmanship. The cat, named Rice, explained that the pot was a dragon luck pot made entirely of pure iron ice crystal. Rice revealed that he had sealed the pot with an ancient matrix and added a small purple stone inside for additional power. Ken, having already experienced a plane crash, time travel, and now the appearance of a talking American shorthair cat, remained surprisingly calm. She noted that this was perhaps the most composed she had ever been, even after all the bizarre events in her life. Rice, however, was enthusiastic, boasting about the pot's power, claiming it was capable of destroying entire worlds. He declared that the Dragon Luck Pot was his finest creation, a piece of royal kitchenware unmatched in all of history. Ken found Rice adorable, admiring his soft, smooth fur, but she quickly focused on the situation at hand. She asked Rice to calm down, suggesting they have a business conversation since they hadn't properly introduced themselves yet. Ken, curious about the pot, inquired why Rice had presented her with such a powerful treasure. She didn't believe he had come simply to be cute or give her the pot without a reason. She asked Rice directly what he wanted in return. Rice seemed pleased by her intelligence, remarking that it was refreshing to speak with someone so sharp. He introduced himself more formally, explaining that he survived by consuming specific foods infused with Ricky. He then asked Ken if she was familiar with Ricky. Ken, after briefly searching her memories, recalled what Ricky was. From her memories of this world, she knew that the Lingnan continent, where northern Yan was located, was a land where strength was paramount. 
power commanded respect, and the strongest people were revered. Ricky referred to a unique form of energy that was central to this world, fueling battles and determining the fate of nations. There were two main types of fighters in this world, Reiki Masters and Ricky Psychic Masters. Powerful Reiki Masters could split mountains and control the seas, while Psychic Masters had the ability to obliterate entire cities and destroy entire nations with their powers. However, the Rika Chef is even more powerful than they are due to the fact that the Rika Chef has the ability to call forth falling shades in order to assist her in becoming a recap. Chef Rice has provided her with the treasure pot, I don't understand why he would pick her out of all the other people. Additionally, what would it be like for him if she trained to become a Eureka Chef? The idea that something is too good to be true is not something that Kaman believes in. Nevertheless, Rice asserts that she is not required to conceal anything from him, since he has resided in this palace for a considerable amount of time, he is well aware of the fact that she is no longer the same. It does not matter who she is because the soul that is now inhabiting this body is a different one. What he requires is this one of a kind spirit. Finally, after years of waiting, he has been rewarded with the discovery of a genius such as she is. As far as Rice is concerned, he will not give her anything either for free or by coercion. Once he has assisted her in becoming a powerful Rika chef, he will receive 50% of the Riki that is produced by the dishes that she prepares. Rice will be responsible for providing the technology and equipment, while Khan will be responsible for providing the materials and labor. This is not a terrible deal at all. Consequently, on the very first day of Fox's arrival in Lingen, she has discovered that her life's purpose is to become a Ricky professional chef. In that case, according to Khan, the bowl of noodles that she just consumed is in fact Riki food that was prepared by a Riki chef. The statement is confirmed by Rice, who also mentions that he is considered to be one of the most skilled Riki chefs in northern Mian. In most cases only the emperor is permitted to sample his food. Ken is curious and asks if the Riki is the cause of the wonderful feeling that she experienced. Rice mentioned that she now possesses his pot and that preparing that kind of Riki food is going to be a piece of cake for her. He then recalls that it is not sufficient to simply possess the pot, and as a result, he presents her with the transformation spoon, which is the royal kitchenware that corresponds to the pot. According to Khan, the lower portion of the transformation spoon has a very peculiar appearance, as it is characterized by vertical lines that are similar to tick marks. She is informed by Rice that the spoon is a transformation spoon, and she is instructed to turn the handle of the spoon in order to transform it. In the process of Ken turning the handle of the spoon, it transforms into a lifter, but it does not change any further. Rice clarifies that it is not as straightforward as it may appear and that it is not comparable to any other royal kitchenware. She is unable to make use of it in the manner that she desires. In order for her to bring about additional transformations, she needs to become more powerful with the strength she possesses. At the moment, she can only bring about changes of level 1. She suddenly has the sensation that she is back in school. Rice says that he will cast the data into Kimmon's brain for the sole purpose of convenience. This will allow her to view the statistics of the dragon luck pot as well as a transformation spoon without any difficulty. When Kanan discovers that this royal kitchenware comes with martial arts, Rice asserts that this treasure is not only useful for cooking, but also serves as a weapon that can be used in combat. He inquires as to the reason behind the expression that she is wearing on her face. After taking a closer look at the kitchenware, Ken comes to the conclusion that she could certainly use it to fight because it appears to be quite sharp. Suddenly an assassin attacks JN with a sword. However, Kian's sixth sense has already brought her attention to the situation and she manages to escape. After Chan leaps out of the window, the assassin follows her out of the building. As the assassin realized Ken was no longer running, he launched another attack on her. However, Ken swiftly evaded him once more, using her agility to her advantage. She counterattacked with her transformation spoon, striking him and pinning him down, the spoon's edge dangerously close to his throat. She gave him one final chance to reveal who had sent him, warning that this was his only opportunity to save his miserable life. If he told the truth, she might spare him. The assassin was shocked, unable to comprehend the situation. The empress isn't supposed to know martial arts. Why does she feel more like a killer than I do? Even as she pressed him for information, he refused to answer. 
Instead, he attempted to attack her again, insisting she shouldn't underestimate him or look down on others. To her, this was not just a threat, but an opportunity, a chance to practice her martial arts with the transformation spoon. She decided to use the total annihilation technique, an advanced move she had been perfecting. She launched a powerful attack that sent the assassin flying into the air. Coley can remark that it was better for him to die outside rather than dirty her palace with his blood. Meanwhile, from the Imperial Garden, the Emperor was observing something unusual. He noticed a figure flying out of the Cold Palace and immediately ordered Falling Shade, the leader of the Shadow Guard, to investigate. Despite having confined Kan to the Cold Palace, the Emperor noted that she continued to act with defiance. He was increasingly curious to see what she would do next. Though Ken was pleased with her mastery of martial arts, she quickly realized the toll it was taking on her body. The techniques, while powerful, were also extremely draining. She noted that she couldn't use them too many times without suffering the effects. Her frail body was limiting her abilities, and she would need to train more if she wanted to fully harness her power. For now, she needed to be more cautious with these moves. Rice, who had been watching the entire ordeal, was unimpressed. He scolded Can, telling her to stop hitting people with his spoon. He was worried that if she got it dirty or accidentally damaged the dragon luck pot, she wouldn't be able to use it for cooking. Ken reminded him that he was the one who told her she could use the spoon for combat, and the situation had required immediate action. After the fight, Ken suddenly felt an overwhelming sense of exhaustion. She explained to Rice that she had drained all her Reiki energy, leaving her feeling completely empty inside. She was too tired to continue and told Rice she was going to sleep. She asked him not to bother her, sarcastically wondering how he could expect such a weak woman like her to perform strenuous physical tasks. Jokingly, she added that if she had known an assassin was coming, she would have cried instead. Before falling asleep, she requested that Rice find someone to repair the broken window caused by the fight. Rice, frustrated by her attitude, sighed and muttered that he had never met a woman as weak as her. The next morning, around two o'clock, Ken awoke with a lantern in her hand and made her way to the royal kitchen's food storage area. As she picked the lock to the storage room, she remarked to herself how simple it was, not difficult at all. Just as she was about to enter, a voice startled her, asking why she was dressed the way she was that night. Ken froze. She hadn't expected anyone to be following her. Confused, she couldn't comprehend when this person had arrived or why she hadn't noticed them. Fortunately, it was just Rice. He asked her why she was sneaking around so cautiously and if she had come to bring him something to cook. Annoyed, Ken scolded Rice for scaring her. She told him that this was no time for fun, she had serious work to do. She then quickly pulled him into the storage room and closed the door behind them. Rice, amused by the situation, asked why Ken had disguised herself as a servant. Ken explained that since she was supposed to be reflecting on her actions in the cold palace, she couldn't simply wander around the palace as she pleased. She had to disguise herself to avoid being recognized. However, given that Rice had immediately seen through her disguise, it clearly hadn't worked as well as she hoped. Despite the failed disguise, Ken's attention shifted to the shiny materials on the shelves. She asked Rice if these were the Reiki components she had heard about. Rice confirmed that what she was seeing was Reiki-infused materials, magical items that could only be detected by those who possessed Reiki abilities. Excited, Ken pointed to a pot of rice that seemed to glow faintly, almost illuminating the room. Rice confirmed that only practitioners of Reiki could see the glow of the rice. It was a rare, Reiki-infused rice, and it was the first time Ken had ever seen such a thing. She was astonished to discover that the rice was a deep, greenish-blue color, something she had never encountered before.